And we are back with another Cannabis Thought Leaders podcast. This is Abe Cohn, your host with THC Legal Group, and today we have Jane West with us. Jane, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Great. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, you know, tell us your full name, where you're working right now. Let us get to know you a little bit better. Um, so I live and work in Denver, Colorado, and I started businesses in the cannabis industry in late 2013. Prior to that, I wasn't involved in the industry and I, I wasn't involved in legalization in Colorado in terms of um, advocating for Amendment 64. I was just a citizen of Denver and I've always been a cannabis user. And when it became clear that adult use recreational marijuana would be legal in Colorado, I decided to start planning um, high-end events that you could consume cannabis at. Okay. okay. And so that was the first business I started in the cannabis space. And that was in January of 2014. Wow. So have you moved away from that business model and, and ventured into other um, different types of businesses or what, what is yeah. your current landscape of entrepreneurial activity look like right now? Yeah. Well, it's very important to, be prepared and able to pivot in this space as we're dancing around not only regulations, but just a very changing landscape. Uh -huh. So um, as the events became more um, widely known and popular, the city decided that they didn't want social use occurring here and um, took measures to shut our events down including sending like a SWAT team to one of our, one of the events in April of 2014. Wow. So that made it clear at the time that we couldn't operate in this gray zone. Um, the events that I was holding were for over a hundred people in a high end art gallery with security and bartenders and catering and food being made right in front of you and live art projects. And I mean, they were a major production and we couldn't risk doing something like that. And then having it be shut down by the police or authorities. Uh -huh. um, and then additionally, I had turned all the summer events into fundraisers for the Colorado symphony orchestra. Wow. Um, and the city base also set, sh shut those down, wanted to shut those down as well because we, they were actually fundraisers, and so they weren't generating a profit for an individual. We were able to keep those on for the summer of 2014. But by the end of the summer, it became clear that we needed to actually work in a concerted effort to le make social use legal, and so and something that is that it was voted on by the by the people of Colorado is something they wanted to allow in this state. We couldn't just keep like hoping it works out operating in this gray area. Um, and that was three years ago and it's taken three years. So they, a lot of advocates and um, people in, at, at the Capitol in Denver came together in 2015 and put an initiative on the ballot, which, which failed. And then in 2016, Oh, no. And then we took it off the ballot in terms of working with the city. Basically, long story short, it takes a really long time to change the laws. <laughs> and yeah. it took three different concerted attempts to get the initiative in place that we currently have and that was voted on by a majority of Denver voters. So a limited adult social use pilot program will be put into place this year in Denver. So now three years later, actually... Um, the original business plan of the cannabis friendly events might become viable again, but we'll see. There's a lot of great companies operating in this space right now already yeah. um, with under private events um, like uh, Irie events, Beck Coop. She, she does mostly more weddings and then Kendall Norris with Mason jar event group. Um, she does high end like three and five course dinners with cannabis pairings and it's, they're wonderful right now, and after the legal le legislation passes, it'll be great when they can just sell tickets openly online and adults can gather together and use cannabis in a social setting. Yeah, very interesting. So that there, there's quite a, a bit in what you just said to unpack, but um, you know, the, the policy side of things is so interesting, and of course, it's complex and, and convoluted, and depending on 
which state you're in, different things have, have gone into effect. Um, how are you personally involved in the, um, if at all, or, you know, how, how are you involved with, with kind of the new law that, that has recently come into effect? Um, were you advocating for cannabis in, in an official capacity? Were you meeting with local representatives of government? How, how did you kind of involve yourself in that aspect of the process? Um, well, there's definitely, um, there's definitely individuals in Denver that completely dedicated themselves to passing, um, the initiative 300, um, Emmett and Kayvon from Denver Relief uh -huh. really kind of like spearheaded it and, um, whole teams of volunteers going door to door to educate people about what this program really was. Cause it was, it's really a very limited program that must be enacted by each local community in order to allow licensing there. Uh -huh. So it's very hands-on working directly with its established business districts that are already determined by the city. And so there's a lot of education that needed to occur behind the initiative so that people would understand what they were voting for. This doesn't mean you can just smoke pot out in the middle of the streets, which not that there's anything wrong with that, right. but People assume that, and when you help them understand what this initiative and limited pilot plan really was, it works. So that's why, like, the door-to-door -door and voters uh, to, to help educate voters was crucial, and that's what they ran. Um, I mostly, I, all through t this year, I've been building my businesses with Jane West and was not as directly involved. I mostly leveraged my network to make sure everyone's informed of when the meetings are happening when volunteer days are and support the overall effort that way. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. So, you know, it sounds like you really have quite a bit of experience and, and networking, um, yes. prowess in the community. This is something that all of our entrepreneurial, uh, listeners are especially interested in. You know, if you're someone who wants to get in this industry and of course, as we said, every, every state is different and, and different rules would dictate, different approaches perhaps, but, but just putting that aside for the moment, um, if you're an individual who wants to get involved in the cannabis industry, who wants to, um, launch either a business directly touching the plant or perhaps an auxiliary business, um, you know, what, what should they know? You know, what, in all of your experience, have you noticed any commonalities among the businesses that, that have really taken off or what, what is your sense of all of that? I mean, I think that there's nothing, yes, there's a lot of things that make the cannabis industry unique and more challenging relative to other areas who might start up a business. But ultimately, the success of the businesses are rely on the individuals and the people that make those companies. Um, and if you're looking at it as an, in an entrepreneurial sense, it's no different than successful business leaders in all other realms. Like, you have to be completely dedicated to your vision and develop a high quality product that users love. Uh -huh. um, so, so like that's applicable across all in right now with the cannabis industry, starting your own individual business from zero. If you don't already know individual people doesn't sound like exactly the right move. Um, unless you've already, you're already operating that business successfully in another realm. Like for instance, if you run a human resources firm at right now, and we know that there's demand and need for formalized human resource structure within the cannabis industry, and you may be able to pivot your business into this space, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, being able to actually provide the service that your business currently provides customers and provide that to the cannabis industry is one of the best ways for an individual that has no previous experience here to actually start engaging um, with vendors or clients in the cannabis space. Yeah. Um, yeah. But when it comes to just like, like your passion about cannabis, the industry sounds really like exciting and fun. You want to be part of it. You have zero experience. Then I would mostly recommend to identify how you want to get involved and the leading companies in that space and see what you can do to get involved with those companies and see what they're doing. If they have positions available, if you can shadow people for the day, um, you have to learn more about what exactly you want to be doing here. Um, so that you can really define your own role. 
I think that's one thing that makes the cannabis space particularly challenging is that there's just not formal titles and structure here right now like you find in other spaces. For instance, um, in like a sales, like a traditional sales team or or a marketing team, like there's departments in companies that we're familiar with. And all of this is being created from scratch right now. So there's an extraction department and then there's, there has to be a compliance department. Um, but also, you know, everything revolved, revolved around vendors and packaging, all, like all, and then there's marketing and then you're operating a giant grow house where you're making basically a cash crop. So, I mean, the possibilities are endless, but um, a lot of like the titles and how these successful businesses are even structured, um, it really depends on what we make it. So it really, and you really have to have a clear vision of what you want your company to be and what you want to build um, because you're really making this up as we go. Very interesting and good advice. You know, of, of the different people we've had on this podcast, um, to those who, who have been asked this, this kind of very same question, I found that there are really two, uh, two different camps. Some are in your camp, and I, and I include myself in that, which is basically saying, look, you know, the cannabis industry is just like any other industry. If you want to succeed, there are tried and true strategies and, and ways of going about conducting a business that are necessary for it to, to, to be one that, that generates profit. Um, and then, you know, other folks seem to think that, look, yeah, of course, all businesses need to be run a certain way, but the cannabis business is unique um, in large part because of its federal illegality and kind of that unique niche that it creates of risk takers willing to kind of um, to, to balance themselves on, on that gray area of the law. And, and that kind of creates an entirely different set of challenges that, that separates cannabis from some of the other industries. But look, I mean, I, I tend to agree with you. Ultimately, all businesses are the same. Yes, each one has its own unique challenges and you have to have a, a compelling vision and the, the will to, to see it through to succeed. Um, it's great advice. Are, are there any businesses that you've run into that really kind of resonate with you or stick out in your mind as being just an amazing cannabis company or, or an amazing way of doing things or an amazing product or something, something that really resonates with you. Uh, this is like sticky. Cause like that, I, cause I know everybody. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I hate like to pick even just like one or three. Um, let me see. Or without um, anyone, okay. Anyone, okay. 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 Yeah. Um, Lauren with Kush cards. So, um, Kush cards are kind of like the hallmark of cannabis and they're adorable little cards for all different, um, occasions. And then you can put a pre-roll joint inside of them. They're like designed for that. Okay. Um, and like, I love everything about this company cause she took her diverse design background and she has a super clear vision of the product she's making and, and who's going to be purchasing it. And it's also a product that encourages normalization cause for instance, we need to start showing people like how this even works as social use, as you know, enter entertaining with cannabis and all these things become normal. Um, and so just like I would bring as a hostess gift to a dinner, a bottle of wine in a wine bag that's designed for a bottle of wine. Right. Um, I could bring joints in this card that's specifically designed for that as well. And it just is like enables that like kind of normalization um, in a cute kitschy way. Um, and she's, she, she set out to um, set up the company. She came, she reached out to me like two years ago. I invited her over to my house. I was like, okay, well I'll show me what you have and I'll, I'll see what I can do. And she sought out, dispensary partners that got a lot of traffic and then made customized cards for those dispensaries as well. Um, and is an example of what happens when you have a clear vision and make smart business decisions and are focused and hustle. Wow. Very interesting. So how would you characterize her branding? Is it, you know, some people in the industry at this point think that new businesses should be moving away 
from, you know, including a leaf in their logo or including the word <laughs> cannabis or weed or THC yeah. in their name. Do you also feel that those words have become slightly too generic and obvious and, and now it's best to kind of come up with even a, a more unique and, and proprietary um, branding approach? So, um, hmm. I think whenever I'm asked questions like these, I immediately relate cannabis to the alcohol and, and wine industry. Um, I want to acknowledge that it is definitely a medicine and there's a whole nother world of information in that realm. Um, but I use cannabis recreationally and I you, you substitute cannabis use with alcohols and I'm making products that will be just like barware in homes in the future. And so I would just to point out, I always speak about it as if it's like a recreational substance we're using. Okay. Um, but to, to, to be clear, if you walk through a liquor store or wine store, you don't see necessarily pictures of wine everywhere. Uh -huh. and, and wine companies don't necessarily have their logo be a gl wine glass or a wine bottle or grapes even. Like there's a lot of companies in, in beer and alcohol that have all sorts like Yellowtail and, um, and it, you know, beer companies like Blue Moon and Fat Tire yeah. that – and, and so when you compare the branding and marketing that way, it does seem somewhat redundant and overused that there's a marijuana leaf on everything right. and that locals are green. So um, when you kind of think about it that way, but you know, I also, to be clear, I'm really spoiled because I'm like in a bubble in a bubble and a bubble and a bubble in Denver, Colorado. But in a lot of prohibition states and states where, you know, initiatives are just being written at this time, just having a marijuana leaf out is something that could put you um, in the in the spotlight or in trouble with the law or raise eyebrows. Yeah, and yeah. so it is important that we are all consistent, you know, putting this out there and talking about it and whatever people need to do that and whatever logos and symbols are using as long as it's overall supporting normalization and legalization i'm all for it very interesting yeah i mean definitely different um different strategies can be applied and, and i'm sure many people have, have different feelings about this so you know ultimately the, the business needs to decide for itself what what the correct um course is um, you know, I just wanted to, to touch on one of the things you mentioned, which I found interesting, which is that in your mind, even though cannabis, of course, is a medicine, you kind of internally frame it um, recreationally because that, that's how you choose to, to use it. Mm -hmm. um, so why do you think it's important for cannabis to be legalized? Do you think that it's, it's a constitutional right that people should just, you know, have the right to consume cannabis? Do you, do you look at it uh, from a fiscal perspective and think that um, the, the tax revenues could, could drive huge amounts of growth and, and bring jobs in and, and benefit the city? Um, what is it about cannabis that, that speaks to you and, and why is it important that, that finally we legalize it, hopefully across the country? Um, well, of utmost importance to me is that I just believe that we should have the right to alter our own consciousness as we see fit as long as we're not harming other people. So, um, you know, I mean, that's why really like the war on drugs is war on people. And I feel strongly that all drugs should be legalized. Um, so, or regulated or regu regulated in a regulated format. Uh -huh. So, um, that's my primary motivation. Um, but additionally, I mean, we just need more solid, long-term clinical studies so that we have the evidence that we need to prove the anecdotal uh, information we're receiving from what cannabis can do for people and the types of ailments it can greatly assist and patients with Crohn's disease and seizure disorders. And I mean, there's, there's a long list of, of ailments that is undeniable. Like you can't deny, you can see the child taking the serum and within 30 seconds, they're no longer having a seizure. Yeah. 
Um, and so, so yeah, it's just, it's really important to keep, you know, that in mind as we, um, talk about all those different options that will happen. But, um, yeah, Yeah, I mean, and I, I think what's, what's interesting about that, you, you really are expressing a strong libertarian intuition, which is that, you know, the government should not be in the business of telling us how to kind of manage our own mental states as long as we're not hurting anybody else. And, you know, our law firm definitely shares that, um, that same sensibility. Okay. Well, listen, we're, we're, we're wrapping up here. I really just wanted to give you the opportunity, um, to tell the listeners a little bit about what, what, what you're doing right now, you know, how they can get involved with you, how to interface with you. Um, Mm -hmm. what, what should people know about you personally and your interaction with the cannabis industry? Um, so in my first three years in the industry, I launched Edible Events Company, and then um, I also founded Women Grow. And in the three years of doing all that work, I kept just getting pulled back to my original passion, which was to create home goods for the future. Wow, okay. <laughs> um, it's not paraphernalia, because it's just a home good, because it's legal. And so, um, so currently with... Jane West. So currently you can find me um, at Shop Jane West, uh, Jane West.com, at Shop Jane West and Jane West.com. You can follow me on all my social channels at The Jane West. Um, but I'm currently the CEO um, of Jane West, and we are creating a line of, of home goods for the future. Okay. We okay. have a glass line that we created with um, – Grav Lab, Grav out of Austin, Texas. So we have a glass line we've created with Grav out of Austin, Texas, that is our vision of what the future of having glass in your homes for cannabis use can be. We have a bong and a bubbler, a pipe, a steamroller, and a taster. And in the fall, we'll have additional colors coming to line. And currently, it's available in a dark cobalt blue that we selected. Um, It really matches a lot of different decors in the home and um also it's dark color prevents the glass from looking dirty um i'm really really happy with it so the glass line was our first collaboration then this summer we're bringing a line of proprietary products to market that all support flower use so um it's basically continuing with the tasters i personally love using um tasters like one hitters um, with the quality of cannabis that's available and I like having like mobile on the go usage. So I wanted to create more sophisticated items to use cannabis on the go, um, and carry it with you in your purse, carry a couple strains. And so we've created products. We, so I partnered with pollen design firm. They're making pollen gear and, um, and Ed killed up there. He actually created, um, the rabbit wine corkscrew. Oh, okay. Um, and so what he is, was able to do with that and make it the most widely distributed wine accessory in the world. Um, but also follows along all of my thinking regarding the normalization of cannabis use and how it's going to just support the barware and other goods we have in our homes. Um, it was the perfect product partner. So all the partner, all the products that will come out this summer, um, I designed with Ed, and that's exciting. Um, that's and so all that will lead into the end of the year, um, the big holiday season, and and having all those products to market at the same time. So my goal this year is to introduce nine new consumption products to market that all support flower consumers. Ooh, very interesting. Very interesting. Wow, that is exciting. Well, congratulations. Very good. Thank wow. you. Um, and how can people reach out and connect with you directly? I mean, I know you mentioned your social media. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so what are some of your – so what's your Twitter handle, for example? Or what? Okay, so Twitter, Twitter, Instagram um, is at the Jane West. Um, those, are the, those are the sites I normally use. Um, you can I, uh, friend me or follow me on Facebook as well. Great. And then the company is at janewest.com, and that will take you to all of our links, and you'll be able to find all of our products and and be able to find out more about what we've been up to, um, read articles and blog posts. And additionally, 
we have a YouTube channel <laughs> that I failed to mention. Um, so we put together a series of videos and tutorials um, because that's what our audience is really asking for. Like, how do I use these products? How do they incorporate in, them into my life? How do I use this vaporizer? So we created a series of very detailed instructional videos of how to use the top selling vaporizers on the market. Um, and I also created videos showing everyone how to use my glass because for a lot of brand new consumers, like operating a carb and using a piece of modern glassware is just something that they want to watch a video on before they try it. Um, so you can go to our channel on YouTube at shop Jane West. Excellent. Well, I personally plan on going there as soon as we hang up. So thank, thank <laughs> you for that info. Yes. Um, wow. Well, listen, Jane, this was uh, spectacular. Thank you so much for coming on. We definitely would love to have you on the podcast again in the very near future, I hope. Great. Um, and thanks very much. This was another podcast with THC Legal Group. I'm your host, Abe Cohn. Until next time. <laughs>